been to very many Thanksgiving events, then you know that eventually you have stories to tell. There's lots of them that have occurred in our family throughout the years. Probably the most memorable was one when my parents had little toy poodles, uh, a little white one called Taffy and a little brown one called Coco. And uh, when no one was looking, Coco jumped up on the table and ate half of her body weight in turkey. <laughs> she literally couldn't stand. Her legs were spread apart. We put her in the garage. We were afraid she was going to blow up. We didn't feed her for two days. <laughs> we all have stories like that. And yet, it is not whether the thing goes exactly as we had planned. It's the people that we're with that make the memories so powerful. And, uh, as I learned from a friend of mine, everything you survive winds up being a good story to tell later on. This is what it says in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Rejoice, how often? Okay. Pray, how often? Now, we're already anxious because if this is a three-strike league, we're already over two. Give thanks in how many things? Yeah, but this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If you want to know God's will, here it is. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. This isn't a command that makes us feel bad. It's actually a call to tell us what's possible. God wants us to be the kind of people who can delight in and bring joy to others no matter what's going on around us. He wants us to be the kind of people that maintain our communication with him whether things are good or bad. And he wants us to be the kind of people who can express gratitude because we've seen what's worthy of gratitude in any situation. So if I were to ask you this morning to start sharing with your neighbor the things that didn't go the way you planned this week, most of us would have multiple things to share. And by the way, the conversation would get pretty animated and uh, usually pretty loud. Our vocabulary for complaint is actually proficient. We have a lot of words we can use to that. But afterwards, we don't necessarily feel better. If I were to ask you to focus on the things that actually went well this week, the surprises that were in them, our voices usually wind up being a little bit softer and our language not quite as descriptive and yet afterwards we will feel like something inside of us has, has grown stronger. What I want you to see this morning is this, that the baseline attitude of a person connected with God is going to be gratitude. The closer you are to God, the more likely you are to be grateful. Now, I know that when I talk on a Sunday that people's minds wander. I have no delusion that I'm such a captivating speaker that you hang on my every word. In fact, I'm going to give you permission for your minds to wander today. After all, we uh, just got through a holiday. By the way, you all, uh, you all look like you lost weight this week, so <laughs> however you managed to do that, I'm not sure. But on the back side, you will notice that there's a lot of blank lines. And if at any point during the talk today you think of an individual or an experience that you are grateful for, just jot it down as we're going along today, all right? just as we're going through. Here's what I want you to see about gratitude, and that is this. You will not acquire more gratitude by acquiring more stuff. Our assumption is, is that if we have more, we'll be more grateful, and it turns out there's no positive correlation with that. And gratitude cannot be experienced by seeking it. You can want to be more grateful, and it won't make you more grateful. As it turns out, gratitude is a byproduct of what you see, not what you seek. Gratitude is a byproduct of what you see, not what you seek. So there are some things that if you see, it automatically begins to convert your heart and your thoughts to more grateful thoughts. For example, see that God is good. His intentions for us are always good all the time. God never has a bad day. If he ever did, none of us would be here anymore. He never has a bad day. He doesn't, his intentions towards us don't fluctuate. He's consistent. And not only is he good, he's generous. He's generous. He loves to give. In fact, there's this great passage in James, the first chapter, which says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. That passage tells us 
a couple of very important things. First of all, every good in our life, every good gift in our life has a single source, and that's God. Now, I know some people might say, well, actually, God didn't give me that. My family gave me that. My friend gave me that. Or I purchased that after working for it. And all of those things may be true, but where did those things come from? If you have abilities and you have opportunities, if you have strength, intellectual capacity, who gave that to you? We're not really self-made. We just take advantage of what has been given to us. And so every gift comes from God, and it tells us that he does not change, which means just as sure as he is generous today, he will be generous tomorrow. We don't have to wait for the sh other shoe to drop. We don't have to wait for God to change his intentions towards us. He is unchanging. So the trick is to actually learn to notice the gifts. And that's what we struggle with. This is what I want you to see is that life is a gift filled with gifts. Life is a gift that's filled with gifts. Now, suppose I told you this morning, I just want to put a disclaimer out, this is actually not true, this is all fantasy now, but suppose I told you that underneath one of the chairs in this room was a card, and that card would be the key that would give you a brand new car that was sitting in the parking lot, and no ordinary car is this, it's a Lexus, top of the line, it has everything in it, and it includes lifetime maintenance and lifetime gasoline for the owner of the vehicle. How many might be a little bit excited about that? And some of you have actually reached. I saw you. You reached under just to see in case that was true. But if you went down and you purchased a car and you worked out a payment, you made your down payment and you worked out a payment for the next six or however many years they do that for now, you worked that all out. I've never seen anybody who acted very grateful to the salesman. In fact, we would say the salesman should be grateful to us because we bought a car from them. As soon as you feel like you have earned something, we lose our capacity to be grateful for it. And lots of people believe that they have earned what they have in life. And it erodes and disintegrates our capacity to be grateful for what we have in life. If we recognize that these things are actually a gift, that requires a position of humility, which is why gratitude and humility always go hand in hand. And if we feel like we've earned something, we feel entitled. And I've, I've never seen entitlement and gratitude go hand in hand. If you do not receive something you actually feel entitled to, you become frustrated and you'll even start blaming people, which is why you hear people blame God for things that happen in their lives is they believe they've done something that earned a better response. So, our ingratitude is actually not so much an emotional deficit as it is a spiritual deficit. When we're well connected with God, things like love and joy and peace begin to be produced in our lives. And when we're disconnected from God, we tend to be impatient and selfish and greedy. When we're connected with God, we, we have uh, what's called self-control. Here's a litmus test. By the way, I would just encourage you to remember this. Here's a litmus test to see if someone's really connected with God or not. If they're working on self-control, that's a sign they may be connected with God. If they're working on trying to control other people, it's a sign they are not connected with God. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control, not controlling everybody else. And so we have this Either we're connected or disconnected from God. Disconnection from God produces the kinds of things that make it very difficult to enjoy life. And ingratitude actually changes the thought processes in your head. It's a great passage that reveals wisdom about this too. It says, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor, what's the next two words? gave thanks. So what happened when they refused to give thanks is that their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. That when we do not express gratitude, there's a thing that begins to happen in terms of how we perceive the world and how we talk about it. But the more you give thanks, it also begins to affect how you perceive the world and how you speak, which is why the more you give thanks, the more you bless. The more you give thanks, the more you bless. 
I was driving down the 490 the other evening, and there was a person who went by me like their house was on fire, and then evidently they did not see me, and they cut into my lane, and I actually had to switch lanes in order to keep from being hit by them. And I have to tell you, it never occurred to me one time to roll down my window, to stick my head out the window, and say, blessings to you! I, I, that's not... I thought of things to say, but that wasn't it. <laughs> wasn't it? The more we give thanks, the more likely we are to bless. Blessing is expressing appreciation for something, and it's requesting God's favor on someone, and it's recognizing what's essentially true about someone and speaking into it. Now, some of us feel like we're almost being hypocritical if we express gratitude when so many things in our life are not going well. And that's not hypocrisy. It's recognizing that in this world, there can be good and bad that coexist at the same time. That's not hypocrisy. That's just being honest. And if we wait until everything is perfect before we can express gratitude, we're going to have to wait till we're in heaven. And for some of us, that could be a while. So God calls us to be able to see the gifts that he has in our lives right now. Now, we can become a kind of person who is only grateful when everything goes our way. But here's what I want you to see. Even in bad times, God gives good gifts. Have you noticed them? For example, if you're going through just a horrific situation that saps the energy and the strength out of you, exhausts you in ways that you couldn't imagine, have you noticed that even in spite of all of that, you still have enough strength to get through the day? Or have you noticed that even though nothing in the situation has changed, there's still this flicker of hope inside of you that eventually something is going to be different than it is right now? Where do you think that hope comes from? Or how about the friends that are in your life? Or doctors, when was the last time you thanked God for a doctor or medicine? I hear people complain about medicine. I get so sick and tired of having to take this stuff every single day. I have a friend who actually asks his blessing on the medication before he takes it, just like he asks a blessing before he eats food. Because he knows, even though his body does not function the way it should, that he's able to navigate life because of the wisdom and the technology that went into producing that medication for him. And we can see that as a gift from God. Don't wait until you feel grateful to express gratitude. Now I'm going to ask you to do a little time travel right now. I'm going to ask you to think all the way back, all the way back to when you got married. Everybody there? I'm not asking you if you think it was a good day or a bad day, just can you remember? And, and then at your wedding, this is very common, people get gifts for their wedding, and then you have to write thank you notes for the wedding. Does anybody remember writing thank you notes? I want to ask you if you enjoyed it or not. Most of people do not say, I get to write thank you notes. They say, I have to write thank you notes. And then there's those gifts that it's really hard to find the language to be thankful for. We would just like to send the gift back. And yet... Gratitude is not an obligation, it's an opportunity. You know what I've noticed? I've noticed that I only really pay attention to the news when it's bad. If there is no terrorist strike today, I don't know that I've ever stopped, paused, and said, God, I want to thank you for a day in which people's lives were not destroyed. I don't know that I've ever done that. Or a day when a natural disaster does not occur. There was no earthquake. There was no fire. There was no tornado. No hurricane. We tend to focus on the bad things that happen, on the disease instead of the treatments, on the tragic events rather than all the days that they don't happen. When we express our gratitude, we're not trying to appease God or butter him up or get more from him. The purpose of expressing gratitude is just to say thank you, our appreciation for him and for what he's done in our lives. So I'm going to give you a little homework assignment. By the way, uh, this message is almost over. I know you're thankful already, aren't you? <laughs> but here's a homework assignment for you. First of all, I want you to write a letter this week. I want you to write it to a person in which you acknowledge the reasons you are thankful to God for them. And don't just say, I thank God for you, signed in your name. Actually give some reasons why you thank God for them. And at least send it to them if 
you may be able to do even more than that. Maybe you can meet with them and give it to them, or better yet, read it to them and then give them the letter. And here's what I want you to notice. I want you to notice how you feel after you're done. I want you to notice what you experience when that occurs. Something remarkable happens when we exercise the opportunity for gratitude. Second assignment is this. I want you to write three things down every single day before you go to bed at night that you're thankful to God for. Three things. You can put them on the back of a note card. You can put them in a journal. You can put them in a note on your smart device, however you do it. But every single day for a week, I want you to identify three things in that day that you can be thankful for. For example, on Thanksgiving, how many had good food on Thanksgiving? We had lemon meringue pie and Toll House cookie pie. And I was asked, which pie do you want? Do you want lemon meringue or do you want Toll House cookie? And I said, yes. <laughs> Aren't you glad there are some days you don't have to choose? Isn't that beautiful? I got both. It was wonderful. I put them both on the same plate, and I didn't care that they touched each other. It was OK. There's good food. And there's honest conversations, and there's moments of joy, there's friends. There are wonderful things in this life that we often ignore. And I want you to do this for a week, and then I want you to notice, how are you thinking differently? How do you feel differently as a result of expressing this attitude? Now, here's the last thing I will do, and that is that it's very easy for pastors to talk about Thanksgiving and then send everybody home. So I would actually like to be thankful today and express that thankfulness to God. And I would like you, you can just listen in. So if you please bow your heads. Father, thank you for coming to our world and to each, each and every one of us individually. Your presence has been like a great light that shines on us when we have been in darkness. And you show us how to live with more grace and to walk in more truth. I'm grateful for that. And thank you for coming in such a humble and vulnerable way. You entered our world as an infant. Your voice didn't scare us. It attracted us to you. Thank you for paying the price for all of our faults and failures. You didn't have to, and we were not able to. But you loved us so much that you did it anyway. And thank you for those moments when you provided insight and wisdom and understanding. The truth is, without your help, I would miss so much of life and mess up so much more of it. And thank you that people feel comfortable approaching you. When we look at how and who came to Jesus, the poor, the sick, the broken, the hungry, the hopeless, the enslaved, they all felt comfortable approaching you. And you helped every single one of them. Thank you for seeing each and every one of us, even though others may not seem to notice. And thank you for seeing everything about us. You see when we get it right, and you see when we get it wrong, and you offer forgiveness and wisdom. You see the wounds that we try to hide, and you work to heal them. You see our fears, and you work to calm them. You see our strengths that you gave us, and you take such great delight in them. And you see our weaknesses, and you help us work through them. You see everything about us, and you love us anyway. Thank you, Father, for showing yourself to us in your word, in the life of your son, Jesus, and in the lives of those who are followers of you. Thank you for sending healing to individuals and to groups, to families and to nations. And thank you for those in my life who remind me that you are actually the source of all the good things that I enjoy. And 
Thank you for refusing to allow me to drift towards darkness and despair. Thank you for challenging my pride and my self-righteousness. Thank you for calling me, for inspiring me, for changing me one day at a time. And thank you for this amazing place called Calvary and this family of faith where we come together to learn more of you and to serve each other and to be transformed by your amazing grace. Thank you for those who serve on our staff and our church family. Thank you for the love and care that you have for their families and for the joy I see on their faces and hear in their voices when they recount the stories of their lives. Thank you for the elders in our church family who choose to serve you by serving all of us. Thank you for safe travels, like when my daughter and son-in-law came to join us this holiday, or when I had to drive home in horrible weather last Monday. Thank you for a home that I look forward to returning to. Thank you for a wife who loves me and appreciates my love of her. Thank you for children who are healthy and bright and gifted by you in unique ways. Thank you for friends. Thank you for the amazing meal I was able to share with family and friends last Thursday. And thank you for allowing me to enjoy wonderful music. And thank you for laughter. And thank you for a heart that is tender enough to still tear up at the things that must break your heart. Thank you for gifts that I've been too busy or too blind to notice. And thank you for allowing amazing people into my life whose days were shorter than mine. The scarcity of their days made them all the more priceless, and you allowed me to share in them. I miss them, but I'm so grateful for the days I had with them. Thank you for giving me a reason to hope that the best is still yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me this morning? sing when I see when I see that cross I'll see freedom when I see that grave I'll see Jesus and from death to life I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace when I see that cross I'll see freedom when I see that grave I'll see Jesus and from death to life I may be seated this morning. In just a moment, we're going to receive tithes and offerings, and this is what I know. I've always been impressed by the kind of generosity that this place shows when there's a crisis, a natural disaster, or something that has occurred to a family or a city. And anytime we've let you know about that, you just, you're ridiculously generous. But what I want to thank you for today is not those moments so much as the everyday ones. 
that it doesn't take a crisis for you to be able to contribute to the ongoing teaching and care of the children who are a part of this place. And for the students who are learning to not only experience God, but walk confidently in their faith. Or the kinds of assignments that staff take on. All of it becomes possible because it doesn't take a crisis for our generosity. And today I wanted to say thank you for that. So Father, we're very grateful for the gifts you've given to us. And we ask that you would do great things through what we return to your hands right now. In Jesus' name, amen.